Today's lobbyist, don't like to call him a guest, is John Bullock, CH, President of the Canadian Federation of Independent Business. But when I first met you about 10 years ago, you had some tiny little two-bit organization you were trying to get off the ground. What was that called? Uh, the Canadian Council for Fair Taxation. It was a kind of a protest against Benson's white paper, and then from that we rolled it into this permanent body. And now you're the $75,000 a year director of Today, how many people? 55,000 companies. What have you achieved? Well, we've achieved probably uh, over a billion dollars a year in tax changes alone, plus uh, we've influenced probably every business bill in Canada over the last five or six years. Mr. Chairman, Senator Governor Schaffner and Mrs. Schaffner, members of the Legislative Assembly, Senator Smith, and ladies and gentlemen, to defend the small businessmen, John Bullock travels Canada coast to coast, talking, arguing, tirelessly putting forward the views of his members. In the first place, we have the centralized bureaucracies who want to control everything except their purchases of paper and their spending. That's the first enemy of small business and communities. Then we have the growing concentration of power in, large oil companies in Truro, Nova Scotia, he attacks big government and big oil companies and helps commemorate the retirement of a long-term mayor. Excuse me. I want to congratulate you because you uh, gave us a great analysis of our internal problem and you have had many important listeners. <laughs> Thank you. Having checked in with a local businessman of a small town, he takes off on a lobbying trip through the Maritimes, armed with a long list of his members' concerns. Here's the stuff from uh, for tomorrow's presentation. Now he will carry his campaign of persuasion into the offices of the political leaders. To Premier Buchanan of Nova Scotia, he talks energy prices and urges that small businessmen should be included in the benefits to be gained from development of new oil and gas reserves. Hibernia and uh, don't forget our own, our yeah. venture. No, right. no, I know that, but oh, yeah. the, the, off the Sable no, Island, but also yeah. uh, uh, the whole range of things, whole and not range. just the limited whole range. to consumer yeah. items. Whole range. Good. Yeah, number 11, that's the beautiful one, Brian. You want to, we've been with you on we that. We're aware percent. of your new legislation. <laughs> and, and, and we went with the survey before it occurred, and we're very, very pleased by the legislation. And so we're going to incorporate all of this into this, in this small business agency. Well, you try to hit it from every angle you can. You, you always tie your visit uh, to a political figure which gives uh, immediacy and news value to, the, uh, to your message and uh, then tie in a major speaking engagement at the same time and, uh, and uh, a press conference. What I propose to do is cover the broader issues that we discussed with Premier Buchanan in our meeting. The issue that has the greatest concern for us at the present time relates to energy because uh, there is no single issue that will have a more substantial effect on the Canadian economy in the next 10, 20 years, or a more substantial effect on the small business sector. The issue really for small business and for the public is how do we turn the spin-offs from the higher prices to our benefit? Most of our press is the product of uh, the press following our events that we make when we travel into a province. The press want to know what we have to say. There's very little management of press. Uh, we have become uh, newsmakers over a period of time, and it's a snowballing thing. It gets bigger every year. Offshore oil will mean big things for this province and Canada. But as far as Newfoundland's small business is concerned, the province is nowhere near ready. That's the message John Bullock of the Canadian Federation of Small Business carried to Premier Peck for today. Every province and region has its own interests and issues. And wherever he goes, Bullock, as national president, gathers local news and exchanges information with his members. Is the, uh, they're setting up a small business agency under the Ministry of Development. Uh, we've already gotten victories in one province and we haven't gotten another, so as we move across, uh, there'll be some things that we, we want. It's like the Small Business Development Corporation. We know they're working on that in Nova Scotia because we're working with them. They've got a task force studying it. With glowing hearts we see A nationalist, a populist, an expert publicist, 
John Bullock has forged Canada's small business community into a political force that politicians must take into account. Bullock told the Rotarians that while Canada as a whole will have to learn to live with slow economic growth, the future of the Atlantic region looks bright. The resource projects of the next 20 years are the most genuine national opportunity that this country has ever faced. And we have to face it as a nation. Now this doesn't mean that provincial priorities aren't valuable. But let's make sure the priorities after the province is the rest of Canada. With Churchill Falls, Hibernia, and gas off Sable Island, big money will flow into the Atlantic region as never before. There's a story, Brian, here of how they've uh, uh, covered the Truro speech. It's very accurate. This is from the, uh, the Halifax Mail Star. Notice how they, you've got to give the press a, a, a punchy uh, sentence or a, or a bit of humor if you want to get a good hitter. And that brings your, your story up to the top of the page. Got issues. You've got issues. When you take all the things we do in combination, we're probably reaching over three million Canadians a week in various ways, so there's, there's no other organization or political person in the country that has that kind of continuous audience that never stops day and night uh, for 52 weeks a year. The Federation is very largely the creation of John Bullock himself. He was born in Toronto, the son of a tailor who was a small businessman of sturdy independence and strong opinion. His father, a lifelong nonconformist, became well known in the city because of his habit of using newspaper advertisements to express his maverick convictions, as well as to sell suits. Well, the idea of the ad was really to speak his, his views and to uh, let people know that uh, there's more than just running a business, that businessmen should have a moral positions, uh, their morality should expand into the business life, so he would take on anybody uh, at any, any time. So it was always amusing to me that uh, he took the moral position first and didn't, never really worried whether it was good for business. He figured if you did the right thing, eventually you could work out all right. Oh, he's, he's taking on, uh, here he's taking on uh, the millionaire socialists, uh, here he's supporting Jerusalem, uh, here he's uh, fighting on behalf of the boat people. He's taking on the Ma Marxist, Maoist, guerrillas, gangsters, murderers. <laughs> well, every so often, if you want to get into something very controversial, somebody get mad enough and throw a brick through your window. And in the last 10 years, he's lost three or four windows. Uh, and the one he thought was quite a record was uh, the, uh, the second story window, which was plate glass, but a uh, good 20 feet up in the air. And he thought, boy, that's a sign of a really good ad. If somebody's mad enough to put a brick through a second story plate glass window, the trouble is they didn't have the second story uh, windows insured. Uh, and he's already covered for broken windows in the first floor. John Bullock, the son, became a teacher, but continued to work in the family business. Then in 1969, something happened that changed his life. I remember 1969 when Benson bought his white paper forward, which would have taxed small firms at 50% instead of 25%. You know, I was pretty angry. I saw it as a threat to the business, and I saw it as a threat to small business generally. So Bullock turned to his father's methods. He used a long business ad in the Toronto Globe and Mail to protest vigorously against the white paper. The day we placed the ad in the newspaper, uh, we received about 100 phone calls. I just took the 10 maddest people and suggested we meet uh, and talk about it. And uh, uh, it was funny, the, 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 the store couldn't get any business done because of all the phone calls that came in from the ad. Uh, you know, the, the, the line was just lit up from morning to night. Almost overnight, a protest movement was born. Bullock decided to give his full time to beating the white paper. And his Council for Fair Taxation organized the fight so successfully that within two weeks, $50,000 was raised at one public rally alone. Within a few months, the white paper was dead. Well, it lasted about a year and a half. Uh, as soon as we achieved our, our victory of getting the government to... Uh, unwind it, then of course we started to decide to unwind the organization because we'd achieved a major victory. And uh, I then went back to the 2,500 uh, uh, small businessmen in the membership. There was about 4,000 people that sent checks in and 2,500 were small businessmen. I went to back the small businessmen and said, hey, you're my natural constituency. Uh, what should we do? Should we wind it up, carry it on? And if we did carry it on, would you give it any support? And there was a 95% response from that group said, carry it on and we'll support you. And it was from there that I created the new organization called the Canadian Federation of Independent Business. From its headquarters in Toronto, 
John Bullock's new federation had to show itself capable of attracting an extraordinarily diverse community of small businessmen. They succeeded so well that over 10 years, they've enrolled an average of 6,000 new members a year, have a staff of 150, with experts in sales and research, provincial and federal affairs, education and media, and community relations. The movement that began with a passionate outburst of anger and indignation directed against a single issue had become an organization with a budget of $5 million, requiring a whole new range of research skills and organizing talents. In terms of renewal sales, That's right. That's right. Well, renewal, renewal percentage is, is very much affected by the effectiveness of the publicity program of the Federation. Probably more than anything else. Exactly. The publicity is a big effect on renewal percentages. Uh, the, the percentage of, of new members in terms of how many calls is very much a product of our basic mandate program and the quality of Dave's men and how they're <coughs> trained and all the rest of it. So how we work together will uh, will uh, will show up very quickly in terms of new business, new members and and uh, and then the more members we get, the more credibility we get. It's a snowballing. With 600,000 small businessmen in Canada everyone a potential member. It is the job of local salesmen to persuade garage owners in Nova Scotia, corner grocers in British Columbia, and small manufacturers in Ontario that they have common interests. And here are a partial list of business people in this area that are taking a few moments of their time each month working with the government in an effort to correct or partially correct some of the problems we're faced with. Mm -hmm. Now the key to the program is a mandate. What we ask that you do is mark on the ballot portion how you feel about these items. Right. Any comments you may wish to make your member of parliament goes on the back. You drop that in the mail in a pre-addressed envelope, and this is what happens. Our tabulation center tabulates your ballot for us and then sends it directly on to your member of parliament. We, we've got uh, three or four purposes behind the mandate. Uh, first of all, we're educating the small businessman, making him sensitive politically to the process of government and what's happening in the political system. So there's an education function. And then uh, uh, secondly, we have a, a political tool because uh, we are finding out uh, from the small businessman what he himself uh, believes. And the majority opinion we get is uh, the basis for our, our action. <laughs> The Federation sends out a million pieces of mail a year to the main centers of influence in the community. To Parliament, government departments, universities, industry. And the mandate questions that are put to members every month, on which this mail is based, are carefully discussed and researched. ...to prosecute as much as scare the wits out of people. Because shoplifting is not a uh, question of poor people uh, stripping stuff out of stores. It's a middle class kind of social de de problem. And, uh, and uh, I don't know whether we have a mandate question. It's an issue again. What we have to do is say, what is the issue? And then do the research and determine whether or not we have a mandate question or an article or, or, or something we pursue from a, a policy point of view. So if shoplifting has to have checks. If we do the research, we may get one question of those two if there's a relevant issue there. Accurate information is the fuel which drives a modern society. And experience has shown that the Federation's credibility depends largely on the questions raised with its members and the accuracy of the data they provide. So a major part of the Federation's effort is put into continuous contact with its members. We call on our members uh, once a year and we do a survey as to what their problems are, whether it be uh, financing, or a shortage of skilled help. Statistics Canada. Stats Canada, as I mentioned. Um, the UIC isn't a great problem with us because we don't have that much of a turnover in staff. So. I see. Okay. So it would be federal sales, customs and excise, and maybe second, Stats Canada would cost Most You have to go into the small business man and get accurate information on how long he's been in business, what kind of business he's in, how many employees he has. Well, given the choice of one, it'd have to be uh, government regulations, I guess, red tape, paperwork. What affects you the most? Federal sales tax, customs, excise, unemployment insurance, record of employment, Statistics Canada? Probably Statistics Canada is... It's a toss-up, really. 
They're all equally bad, but Stats Canada seems to give us the most paper to fill out. This then is a powerful political action tool. When you have these kind of results and they're accurate and precise and you can break it out 50 ways, this information is the way you talk, to, uh, the way you influence the civil service. They want knowledge, they want information they can't get anywhere else, and knowledge is power when you're dealing with the corridors of government. Besides the, uh, the various types of surveys that we do uh, uh, to get specific information from our members, we sometimes give them what we call action alerts. Uh, the word action alert uh, is, a, is an alert warning that this issue is of significance, drop everything, uh, give us your views, or take specific action right away. And with one action alert, we could flood uh, 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 every member of parliament with mail, or we could, uh, we could uh, have the phones ringing day and night for two weeks solid. Let's have some French blood in there. Uh, even uh, those who uh, lobby uh, openly and above board, and that's a good thing in, in the legislative corridors, are, are dividable. They uh, represent those who are naive, that believe because uh, of the rightness of their cause, they're going to be able to convince politicians to go in a certain direction. And those who understand the power and represent voting blocks and are able to say uh, to the politician, now uh, I want to know your exact position on this issue because I have 5,000 members who are going to decide how they vote as to your position on this issue. Now that is power lobbying, and that is the more sensible, rational approach. The naive lobbying is to come and think that they're going to persuade uh, politicians on the basis of logic and reason. First of all, Atlantic went well, no problems. Peckford meeting went fine, we got, got our photographs, got our, got our press conference, no problem. Uh, I don't know if we'll be that lucky again, but that was, that was the best scheduled trip we'd had. Okay, so we Politicians react to pressure, and a lobbyist like Bullock cannot afford to let the politicians forget that his membership has political clout. He meets leaders from all parties, and the publicity is important to both sides. We have to go through the Premier's office. Now, do we have direct connections in the Victoria, or do we have to switch over at Vancouver? Uh, Vancouver. You have to switch you over. Vancouver. Change flights? Yep. Well, I'm going to call our director in uh, Vancouver and see if we can tie in a speaking engagement. Uh, uh, well, I could, do, I could do Victoria at noon, you know. I could do a rotary at noon in Victoria and save us jumping back to Vancouver. You want to do a speaking engagement at noon for press. Press don't come out at night. They'll come out at lunch, though. I want to do a couple of talk shows, too, when I'm out there, you see. So I should stay Bullock with. prepares for a tour of Western Canada. He takes with him a list of his organization's priorities, compiled from the mandate and other surveys, along with information that politicians might not have, and he reads the recent speeches of the men he's going to meet. The tour begins with a call on an Alberta cabinet minister, Mr. Adair. Then you've got a, a new problem, so you can see the difference between... Uh, the Alberta and the national response, the, the, the pressures are very much there. And we have yet, and I think they're going to get worse. Well, there's no question when you stand to uh, talk to, and you're saying 600 Alberta businessmen, uh, that number one where you're talking about qualified labor is a concern, I think, to us as yeah. a government as well as it is to that particular oh, yeah. individual. Oh, yeah. Incidentally, uh, if you people are interested, we've got, uh, for all of these questions, a very uh, extensive breakout. What is valuable is that your own research people as you start to develop positions, should access our, our facilities for nothing. You just have to make a call and say, can you give us a breakout of that information as follows, and we'll just Xerox the computer sheets and put them in the mail to you. Keep that in mind, tell us. The research data that's, that we get from our members, which would cost you 50 grand to try and find yourself, you get for nothing, just ask for it. How did you vote in the last election? I won't tell you. Why wouldn't you tell me? I don't even tell my wife. You voted Tory. I wouldn't tell you regardless. Now, why not? Because uh, it creates too many problems for me. In other words, you're just not going to tell me how you voted in the Absolutely last election? Absolutely not. We're a totally nonpartisan organization. Because you're a, a lobbyist and you didn't show your true colors. <laughs> because we work with every party. Uh, Appendix E is, of course, our, our breakdown. Our base is about 6,100 companies in the province. Very good. Uh, number nine of interest, you can see the priority from small businesses tax related. They're very, that's the nature of the animal. They're very responsive to tax changes. And I think uh, you'd find uh, that from the average citizen, everybody wants lower taxes. Well, in small business, though, the, you know, it's m much more dominant. You know, if you want to start a revolution, that's how I got going was on, 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 on fence and tax issues, you know. Yeah.
Well, you, you're hardly a three-piece revolutionary. No, no, I'm a very, very yeah. sensible, quiet guy, a bit like yourself, you know, kind of introverted. Yeah. Appendix C. We both are handicapped. Yeah, yeah. Appendix <laughs> C. Uh, uh, that gives you the latest feel of the priorities at in terms of the problems that face the small firms. Yeah. Financing has jumped away up with the right. interest rate issue. Right. That's not unusual. I'm not surprised. Yeah. You were happy, of course, with the election. No, not really. One way or the other, it doesn't matter to me. Get but them away from television, they're all the same, Jack. What do you mean they're all the same away from television? Well, you can only tell party differences when they're speaking on television. If you get them uh, in committees behind the room, you couldn't tell whether they're liberals or NDP or conservative enough they put signs on their foreheads. In other words, the, the, whole, end, the whole media campaign, the whole media re reportage is just a lot of hypocritical gobbledygook. It's what you call good theater. Financing issue is the interest rate issue, Bill, as you can imagine. Uh, I'll tell you what we've been doing federally in the last three weeks. We've uh, put a message through both the Bowie, uh, the Department of Finance, and the Prime Minister's office that uh, we should be in a position, if we can get a, an early uh, resolution of the oil pricing issue, which I believe we can, we're sitting out there with maybe $1.4 trillion of development projects over the next 20 years. Oh, the only thing just is incredible. destroy it is government itself, Don. I have always said the potential is there. It can be harnessed or, or the opportunities can be taken away. Yes, I apparently it was set up on one of my staff that we're supposed to be over your studio at 4.30. Okay, we'll see you soon. Bye. Most Bye. lobbyists approach the seats of power behind closed doors. But Bullock prefers everyone to know what he is doing. His many TV shows, press conferences, and meetings persuade politicians that he can command attention. The Federation keeps up a constant stream of propaganda, distributing free editorials to 130 radio stations and 300 newspapers every week. Canadian Federation of Independent Business, cut 16, gloom and doom, one minute and 58 seconds. For Canadians, life is not nearly as bad as the situation portrayed by those doom and gloom articles in the nation's major media. Certainly Canada has problems, but compared to other countries, we're the next thing to utopia, and the potential surpasses that of any country in the world. Attention-getting publicity stunts and advertising are used in every medium so that the Federation's influence is pervasive. The message even gets to schools by means of comic books and class materials. There are 300 trade and professional groups and 200 national organizations with headquarters in Ottawa. Every day, they must pay detailed attention to the politicians and bureaucracy, to the nuts and bolts of decision-making. We've been promoting splitting industry, trade and commerce to try and get a ministry of industry and small business and a ministry of trade. Politics can be a minefield to a group that tries to be friendly with all parties. So the Federation has hired Jim Bennett, former special assistant to Cabinet Minister Jean Chrétien, as its national director, the man responsible for contacts with the federal government. It doesn't hurt to be on a first-name basis with the minister. To take uh, when I was there, you know, the bias was the same. When I imposed a quota on textiles and clothing and so on, as Jimmy was there, However important the political contacts, a successful lobbyist must understand the inner workings of the bureaucracy. Uh, some people that don't immediately spring to mind when you think of small business, but who have a major impact, like the people over in Energy Mines and Resources, who are working on uh, uh, the, the energy pricing and the industrial strategy that uh, is going to sp spin off out of that. And as a result of working with people that I knew in industry, trade and commerce, they put me in touch with people in energy mines and resources who hadn't really been looking at the, the small business uh, side of things. Before they even go to the ministerial level or to the government level, um, they take very good care now to soften up the bureaucracy. They'll keep in touch with the key people in the civil service in key areas. They'll keep flooding them with information on a certain subject with results of their own research. And what happens, strangely enough, is that the civil service often uh, takes the stuff and says, well, this is something I didn't know, by golly. And the Federation is, is, is sharp enough to allow the bureaucracy to use this as if they had discovered it themselves and bring it to the ministerial level. Then the Federation will move into the public eye deal with the minister. The minister, of course, will take the credit. The federation will take the credit. But in the meantime, the bureaucracy has been, as it were, um, 
softened up for this. I think I have to go back to whoever's the new Prime Minister and say we would like to submit names in, in the following boards and agencies of which we have an interest. We've been offered it in the past, we've just never taken it up. And then this time, see if they play games with us and start, you know, go through the routine of saying yes, give us your names, and then start appointing political, uh, making political appointments. It's worth Once you have won the ear of government, influence follows. And the Federation is among many organizations invited to nominate people for appointment to government boards and agencies. Uh, cod, uh, soft drive, cod uh, marketing agency. I mean, that we were asked if we wanted to, that was part of the list. <laughs> I mean, the list is about 400 agencies and board. We only wanted people on 12 out of about 400. And then the whole 12 were political appointments. So the thing was a very upsetting process. And one, of, one of the ways that we might, and having seen that process from the other side, the names that the, the ministers get and the, the pressure they get from their, their colleagues, one of the ways we might have to do it is that, you know, you don't give one name to uh, the Prime Minister's office. If we've got uh, someone uh, who is in a particular riding, who's uh, very, very good, and who just, we know, happens to support the party in power, we put that name forward to the responsible minister, you know, because it, it's, it's not just a matter of political hacks. It's a matter of someone who's qualified, who's from a, a specific geographic area, and who also supports the party. If you, get two, <laughs> yeah. if you get two people who are equivalent to one that supports the party and power gets in it. That's, <laughs> the, extra, that's the extra qualification. Of course. Yeah. You know, you're going to have to consider, because they do, the geographic uh, considerations, and the fact that uh, if uh, we're, for example, putting forward the name of someone mm -hmm. who's a uh, very, very active uh, organizer for the, uh, one of the opposition parties. There's just no way. No. Just, we're wasting our time if we do that. And uh, you do have to, to be able to move around inside uh, the departments and, and build up a, a trust and a working relationship where some of the people know that, okay, I can tell you this off the record, and then you, you know, use it uh, you know, discreetly. There's widespread talk that they might even go for a 15-week entrance uh, requirement into the plan. I don't I would think they go through. Here, Bennett and Bullock discuss proposed changes in unemployment insurance regulations with the employer's representative on the Unemployment Insurance Commission, making sure that the needs of small businessmen are taken into account. Alberta shaping up. Well, that's encouraging because uh, in the last three weeks, just what anybody I've talked to, any kind of program in, in Ottawa, they say, well, everything's going fine. I think if I were to try and assess their biggest accomplishment, it would be in terms of organization. They've been able to weld this into a coherent, a sort of cohesive force with a very articulate spokesman at the top, with a team of researchers whose work is serious enough and, and um, adequate enough to make government listen. We are entering a decade of tremendous change in this country, as well as all over the world. The question is, do we have the political will to adapt to this new world? Turning expensive energy and slower international growth into opportunities for 25 million Canadians. But people should understand how the system works. They have the power out there. Every vote counts. A group of votes counts more, a larger association of votes counts even more. You have to understand is who's trying to influence the politicians, why they're trying to influence the politicians, and understand that they should, as citizens, be their own lobbyists as well. That's what, if they're not doing it, somebody else is doing it against it. Really if, if, uh, if you're not doing it, the oil companies are doing it every day. If you're not doing it, the corporations are doing it. You just take a good look at the tax system out there and see how you're getting hosed. And uh, you say to yourself, well, this isn't fair. This isn't right. It's got nothing to do with fairness. It's got nothing to do with right. It's simply a matter of power. Who's got the ear of power? Who makes the decisions? Don't get upset about it, folks. Just think about it.